Such an unholy amount of work goes into making the sinfully good Lucifer that every episode is bursting with rewards for Lucy fans. yippee ki movie lovers, I'm Jan, and today I'm revealing 40 behind-the-scenes secrets, wicked details and fiendishly clever callbacks that'll make you love Lucifer Season 5 even more. Spoilers ahead, so take care if you're not all caught up. Since it first appeared on Lucifer's hand in the pilot episode, fans have been wondering if there was more significance to Lucy's ring than just a simple accessory. And season 5 gave us the answer, as the show travelled back to the 1940s for a noir episode featuring Maze's mum Lilith, the ring's original owner, who gifted it to Lucifer when she gave up her immortality. However, the secret behind how it came to be in the show is much more mundane. Shortly before they started filming the pilot, director Len Wiseman told Tom Ellis that he thought there was something missing from his outfit. That sent Ellis rushing back to the costume department, where he found a random box of jewellery and picked out the now famous black ring. The ring's last minute addition to the series even popped up as a little inside joke in season 2, when Lucy and Amenadiel were trying to find the final piece of the flaming sword. Your ring. I've never seen you without it, maybe that's the key. Well, the key to completing my ensemble, maybe. Although we now know the ring stone is from the Garden of Eden, Lucifer says it's only special because it reminds him of his old friend Lilith, hence why he was so keen to get it back after Candy stole it in Season 3. Sentimental value. An especially intriguing new detail about the ring that you might have missed is that it didn't always look like it does today. Notice how when we first see it on this poster of a black gloved Lilith, the stone is actually white, and it stays that way until Lilith gives gives up her immortality, breathing her soul or essence into the ring, causing the stone to change from white to black. Something that's become quite a tradition for the show's season premieres is the appearance of Mr. Set Out Bitch, and that continues in season 5 where we learn his real name, Lee Garner. And the inspiration for that name comes from Lee Garbett, who is the artist behind the recent Lucifer graphic novels, and he also created the comic book Skywood with Lucifer co-showrunner Joe Henderson, and we saw Trixie reading that comic in season 4. This time Lee's stuck in his very own hell loop, and in a callback to previous occasions, he ends up sporting very little, though this time it's his own choice to wear just speedos, unlike in season 2, where Lucifer left him wearing underpants and a tiara after catching him robbing a jewellery store, and in season 3, where Lucy found him in the desert driving a stolen truck and again left him in his undies. Season 4 of course switched things up, with Lucy being left pantsless after Lee tried to rob him but ended up with a devilish gift of cash and gold bars. According to IMDb, Lee is back in the final episode of part 2, so it'll be interesting to see if he gets the redemptive arc some fans have been hoping for, and if his storyline will mirror Lucy's circumstances again as it did in part 1. The show's writers have been talking about introducing the character of Michael for a while, hence the season 4 name drop when Linda and Amenadiel were working out what to call their soon-to-be-born son. What about Michael? No. Definitely not Michael. But according to Joe Henderson, it was his co-showrunner Ildi Modrovich who came up with the idea for Michael to be Lucifer's twin in the series. Because originally season 5 was just 10 episodes and the show's final season, Michael was only going to impersonate Lucifer for part of an episode. But when Netflix increased the season order to 16, the showrunners decided to spend a whole episode with Michael pretending to be Lucifer, really digging into his devilish twin's life. Speaking to Backstage magazine, Tom Ellis revealed that the new challenge of playing both brothers messed with his head a bit. Given the show's tight filming schedule, using transformative prosthetics to differentiate Michael was off the table. So Ellis took inspiration from his theatre roots and went old school, working out Michael's physicality and voice. He started with some basic concepts and built from there, for example Lucifer is a very flamboyant, open character and shows that in his body language, while Michael is the opposite, a closed off quiet observer rather than a talker. Likewise, clothing was crucial to getting into character, with Lucifer's sharply tailored suits contrasting with Michael's loose-fitting tweed jackets and turtlenecks, though it is similar to one of Lucifer's looks in the comics. By the way, the scar Lucifer gives Michael using one of Mazikeen's blades after their face-off in the third episode is a brilliant hat tip to the comics, where Maze actually scars Lucifer's face with a blade in a similar way. Another lovely little detail some of you commented on my other videos is that the twins are even poles apart when it comes to drinking, with Michael preferring clear spirits like vodka and drinking with his left hand, whereas Lucifer drinks whiskey with his right hand. Indeed, according to Tom Ellis, Michael hasn't quite got the liver of Lucifer and likes to stay a bit more lucid and aware of what's going on. 
When it came to Michael's voice, Ellis went for an American accent to help distinguish between the characters. And that's especially interesting because initially, before the show's very first season, when Ellis was working out how best to play Lucifer, he actually tried that accent out, but felt that Lucy always ended up sounding like a jerk. However, with an English accent, he found Lucifer could get away with saying all sorts of terrible things and still come across as rather charming. Ooh, how's your ex? Detective douche. Which is why switching to that original American accent makes perfect sense for playing his villainous twin, Michael. How do you like the mess I made, Samael? And fun fact, Ellis has a twin sister in real life, and coincidentally, her name is Lucy. The payback board Lucifer creates as he plots his revenge on Dan for shooting him is full of hilarious in-jokes and callbacks to previous episodes. From Dan's time undercover as a surfer and actor Kevin Alejandro's own love of catching a wave, to the action movie franchise Weaponizer which Dan adores. Personal fave, Weaponizer 4, the last arsenal. So that bit at the end of the whole... Yes. <laughs> to the recurring topic of Dan's love of pudding, and the fact that Lucifer thinks that eating Dan's dessert isn't punishment enough. And judging by what Lucy wants to do with Dan's bracelet, it looks like there'll be no more bracelet bros. Bracelet bros for the win. Oh, and there's even a little shout out to Queer Eye, Netflix's life makeover show. Ella thinks of Lucifer as a brother, so she's really annoyed that he not only failed to say goodbye when he left LA, but that he also didn't let her know when he returned. So when he turns up at the team's latest crime scene, Ella gives him a piece of her mind and a thump with her shoe, which is a little nod to the Latina heritage of both her character and actress Amy Garcia who plays her, and the tradition of whipping off a shoe or chancla to reprimand or discipline someone. No mas a mierda, okay? No mas. Of course, that isn't actually Lucifer, it's his twin brother Michael. But Ella doesn't know that. And when it came to episode 8, its writer Chris Rafferty also worked with the show's art department specifically to sneak in some fun for the show's die-hard fans by adding some cunning callbacks to previous episodes that he wrote. When Lucy and Ella visit the Whisper Killer's latest crime scene, there's some cleverly titled film posters on the wall. First up is A Bad Day to Die, which has the tagline, her time is ticking to find the cure, mirroring the season two, episode 13 title and plot of A Good Day to Die, where Lucy returns to hell to try and find the antidote to a poison that's quickly killing Chloe. And there's another Easter egg to that same season two episode via a door that's labeled 213. Then there's a poster for Monsterish, a shout out to another season two episode called Monster, about a murder at a zombie themed wedding. And there's a priest walks into a barn, a play on the season one episode, a priest walks into a bar, where Lucifer met the priest Frank Lawrence, who's one of the few humans in the series who figured out Lucy's true identity. Your father has a plan. God finally makes his first on-screen appearance in the mid-season finale with Dennis Haysbert in the role. And that bit of casting means this isn't just a reunion for our favorite celestial family, but also for Haysbert and Amenadiel actor D.B. Woodside, who previously worked together on the action drama 24, where they played brothers, each of whom became President of the United States. In fact, when it came to casting God, Woodside actually suggested Hayes but to the Lucifer showrunners, who according to EW, had him at the top of their list of possible actors for the part. Two real-life women who greatly inspired Leslie Ann Brandt's portrayal of Maze on the show are Grace Jones and Eartha Kitt. So it's no coincidence that one of the songs performed by her mother Lilith was made famous by none other than Eartha Kitt. In fact, Brandt told the Spectrum Lounge podcast that Kit's I Want to Be Evil and Someone to Watch Over Me, memorably sung by Ella Fitzgerald, were chosen to pay homage to two black American icons. As well as Eartha Kitt, the episode's writer Ayanna White also looked to Billie Holiday for inspiration for Lilith's character. As for film noir, the show's creative team chose that not only for its links with detective stories, but also because it fits the old Hollywood elegant style of Tom Ellis's Lucifer so well. And adding to the show's tributes, the episode frames its tale of Lilith in 1940s New York with what the showrunners have called their Princess Bride moment, as Lucifer narrates the story of his Manhattan adventures to Trixie, who interrupts with questions and comments. Wait, hold it! Oh, for crying out loud. Hold it, hold it. What is this? When you look back over season five so far as a whole, there are several motifs and themes which recur strongly throughout. And one of the most intriguing is a motif of mirroring or doubles. There's the obvious example of Lucy 
Lucian is twin Michael, and there's the way Maze decides to dress and act exactly like Ella. Then the whole of episode 3 is insanely meta, about a murder on the set of Diablo, a TV procedural that mirrors Lucifer and Chloe's working relationship, has doubles of all our favourites, and also mirrors the Netflix show we're watching. On top of that, the dead showrunner is a spitting image of Lucifer's co-showrunner Joe Henderson, whose own real-life office and writer's room double as the ones in the fictional show. And the fourth episode takes episode 3's doubling to a whole new level, giving the show's cast new roles to play that reflect their usual ones, so therapist Linda's a bartender, detective Chloe's a PI, Dan is the super douchey Willie the Sausage Prince, and Lilith... Maze's mother, her spitting image, though neither of them would ever admit it. And regarding Maze, there's a parallel this season between how she feels abandoned by her mother and Linda's situation with her daughter who she gave up for adoption. Even the season's secret serial killer Pete has his own mirror in the copycat killer Klumpsky. As for Chloe, she gets to mirror Lucifer's mojo superpower. And if you'd like to know the true cause of that and also why Lucifer's invulnerability changed in season 5, tap here to watch my Lucifer and Chloe powers video or follow the link in the video description. So who were your favourite characters this season and did you spot any other interesting details? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this, a thumbs up and a share are hugely appreciated. Next, tap left for my Lucifer playlist with a full breakdown of the mid-season finale, predictions and theories for part 2 and season 6, plus more amazing easter eggs you might have missed in the fifth season. Thanks for watching and see you next time, yippee ki movie lovers!